Listen, Abel, we are back in the studios, uh, hopefully getting you through some isolation. Um, that's what seems to be some of the messages we're getting through, Dylan. Yeah, which is surprising because actually people are liking our content, Angus. Oof, Can you believe it? So first time ever. It's, uh, it's been pretty humbling the amount of messages we've got of, as we said, the people with a disability who are enjoying the podcast, but more so the able-bodied community who it's, are learning things but doing it in a different in a different way, an entertaining way, in a real relatable way. So to everybody that's come on and shared their stories, we can't thank you enough. And also, so many people are getting in touch wanting to come on. Yeah, we're getting a lot. Cool. The email exists. It's listenable at podcast1.com.au. Send us any suggestions of people you'd like to hear on our podcast. A big thank you to a lot of um, people working at the NDIS within the disability world who are able-bodied. Uh, occupational therapists, OTs. A lot of people are messaging and saying, thanks for shining the light on a world that I've known that my friends have no idea about. So. It's amazing, and today's opportunity to chat to one of the greats is amazing. Yeah, when when we came up with this idea for this podcast, uh, one of the first. Oh, the first. Let's yeah. be honest. The man that I wanted to have on this is is someone that I've definitely looked up to because of what he's been able to do, not only with his career, but more so what he represents, and he represents my community so well. And I've had the privilege on working with him a couple of times, um, going on his on his world famous TV show. I was pretty chuffed when he asked me to come on, especially because I was Australian and it's based over in the UK. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a, he's back in Australia, obviously for a little bit and we're super excited to have him on. So I think it's about time he introduces himself. G'day, my name's Adam Hills. I'm a comedian, I'm a TV host. Uh, and right now I am a part-time teacher. <laughs> from the isolation of your very own bedroom on a zoom record we're very excited to have you adam and uh, what is your disability uh i was born without a right foot uh i don't even know the technical term or the scientific term but i do know that if i was competing in the paralympics i would be classified under uh quote the others Yes, oh. Les Autres. Is that Les right? Autres. I've always thought <laughs> oh. if, if i ever got famous enough that i had to check into a hotel under a fake name I would use the name Les Autres. <laughs> yeah, good. So for, for disabilities that don't classify as, I think it's cerebral palsy, paraplegic, vision impaired, hearing impaired, um, or an intellectual disability, they're called Les Autres. Yeah. So they're people of short stature, people with weird amputations, I can say that, no? um, and all these different things. So you're actually you're a Les Autres. I don't know that many Les Autres. Really? I, and I love the fact, I mean, Les Autres sounds like, a, like scientific or it sounds kind of fancy or at least technical, I'm pretty sure it's just French for the others. And <laughs> so I love the idea that they would have been classifying people and they've gone, okay, what's that? That's an amputation. What's that? That's cerebral palsy. That's a vision impairment. And then there's a whole group of people that they went, oh, so what are they? I don't know. And they're just the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Can we call them that? I don't know. Barry, what's, say it in French. It sounds fancy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, there's a great joke about oranges and carrots when they were naming them. Someone went, uh, what's this? It, 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 Call it a carrot. And what's this? It, it's o orange. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll do. Um, hey, before we get into your, your, your life story, how are you as a teacher? You any good? I, so I've kind of invented about four or five different characters for the kids as different teachers. Um, it started off with, uh, I don't even know how we got, so the, their, their principal is, is, her name is Miss Ganane. And I mispronounced it as Miss Janine, which my daughter thought was hilarious. Yeah, and I went, oh, no. And then it became a character, Miss Janine. Hi, everyone. Miss Janine here. Janine, Janine, actually. Janine, Janelle, Janine's the full name. <laughs> uh, and then every subject, it just became a different teacher. So there's kind of like a German exchange teacher called Mr. Guntenschreiber. Nice. There's a really boring American um, PE teacher called Ned Fneedman. And now the girls have got to the point where they want me to dress up every morning as the different teachers. Nice. So it's kind of becoming this whole sketch show. The only problem is they don't, take, well, my, my youngest in particular doesn't take me seriously. So I'm trying to teach her maths. Mm -hmm. and mathematics is a very exciting subject. You can tell from my voice how overjoyed I am to be teaching it. <laughs> and um, she's going like, do everything as Sneedman. So I'm going, okay. 86 plus 10 is what? And she's like, Ooh, and I'm like, no, actually, you need, to, you need to actually answer this question for me now. She might not want to go back to school. Oh, man. I Listen, Fneedman's going to have a breakdown pretty soon and start <laughs> shouting at the kids, so they're going to have to go back to school. Do you, um, because obviously you, you work with the Paralympics, you've hosted TV shows around disability. Do you, ever, do you teach your kids about disability? Because when we started this podcast, I, was, I, I didn't know much because Dylan's the first person in my life our family and friends that has a disability. So I was kind of walking with blinkers on my whole life. 
It's a bit of a weird one. So we, I, the only way I can explain it to you is to give you two examples. So we were at the Para Athletics Championships in London, which I think was about 2017, maybe, at um, the Olympic Stadium. And I took my daughter and one of her friends. So they would have both been about seven. And we spent a day walking around the park and seeing like, there was a disability breakdance troupe that had been on the last leg. So we kind of watched them and had a chat to them. And, you know, the girls played wheelchair basketball. They loved all that stuff. And what I found was fascinating, it was at the end of the day, my daughter's friend, the, the other little seven-year-old was going, I mean, a little posh English girl, by the way. I mean, that's amazing. Who knew that people with disabilities could break dance like that? That's amazing. And it really opened her eyes to the world of disability. Whereas my daughter was like, what? What's the big, I don't get what the big deal is because she's grown up with a dad who's got one leg. She's met, you know, Paralympians. She's met other people with disabilities. But so in that, in that instance, when it comes to kind of amputations and wheelchair and, and stuff like that, she's across. But then I've been playing disability rugby league and we had a, we had a dinner up in Warrington with all of the team. And one of the guys uh, has cerebral palsy and he doesn't speak particularly well. So whenever he walked past, he would tickle the girls. He would tickle my daughters. And the six-year-old kind of went, she, she wasn't liking it. She said, Daddy, he keeps tickling me. And I said, well, that's because he's got a thing called cerebral palsy. And it's very hard for him to talk and be understood. So his way of saying hello is to just tickle you. And then she was fine with it after that. But now she thinks it's called terrible palsy. <laughs> 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 so it's a nice i mean I've, i feel kind of privileged that i can teach them or at least explain to them stuff about disability and i feel really kind of proud when i see that reflected in the way they talk about disability as if it's just not a big deal now a lot of people my partner chantelle i was telling her that we're having you on the show and i was very excited and she was like well you got adam adam hills on the show like what's his relationship with disability and i don't think everybody would know that as you said you've had one leg your whole life can you take us mm. back to to growing up were you always i guess proud of your difference did it did it get in your way when you were a kid it didn't really get in my i mean i've been really lucky i kind of i mean the way i see the last leg is much the way that i see the spicks and specs so the reason spicks and specs worked at the music quiz show here in Australia is because Alan and Miff were proper music nerds. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of halfway in between. I had enough experience of, of music that I could translate what was going on. But also I wasn't so much of a nerd that I didn't know how to talk to everyday people about it. And I kind of feel the same with disability in the last leg in that, you know, Alex is properly disabled. Yeah. I'm halfway in the middle yeah. and I can all, like, literally I've got a foot in both camps. Yeah. So, I can, I can translate disability for able-bodied people. So I guess growing up, it didn't, it didn't feel like I was disabled. I never considered myself disabled. I've, I'm, and for those who don't know, I've got an ankle joint. I can, I can bear weight on my right foot. I can walk without the prosthetic. It just means, you know, one leg's longer than the other. So it, there were very few things that it stopped me from doing. I used to joke about I couldn't wear thongs. <laughs> uh, that was about right. the only thing. And it, I, Honestly, about the age of 13, you know, I had a meeting with a specialist who said, is there anything the other kids could do that you can't? Really, genuinely. And I said, yeah, thongs. I just want to wear thongs. <laughs> Havianas, so, Doc. <laughs> hey, they've got Havianas with like a little strap around the back now. So you can almost, they're almost like a sandal. Do you know that? That's, that's what I needed. Yeah. So they, made a, they made a prosthetic with a gap between the two, the first two toes so that I could slot a thong in there. But I didn't realize until you walk that you actually grip with your toes yeah, you when to, you walk. Thong. Exactly. Yeah. You need, it's like a opposable thumb. You need some grip strength in there. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll leave you two to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. doesn't know I mean, this was a whole new world for me too. <laughs> um, what about as a kid? Was it explained to you, Adam, um, about what happened in the womb for you to be born without a foot? No, because I don't think anyone ever really knew. I yeah. remember watching uh, look, I'm going to say I was about seven or eight. I might've been a bit older at my grandparents' house. I vividly remember this actually watching a TV show. And it was the first time they'd ever been able to film like the development of a fetus. And so they showed it at different stages of, I don't know, six weeks, 10 weeks, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a certain point where I looked at that, the, the feet of the fetus and went, Oh my God, that looks like mine. Because it was like a little nub with two tiny toes on the top of it. And that was the, that was the only time I'd ever seen anything that resembled what my foot looked like with the two little toes sticking out the top. Um, 
but no one's ever been able to to come up with a reason of why my foot is the way it is. I genuinely don't know. My mum, my mum thinks it's because she was lifting boxes when, before she knew she was pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Sav Blanc she drank before. <laughs> she <knew this> <laughs> weeks. My mum had like hay fever for three days straight. And she's like, that's all I can think of. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I don't think a few couple of sneezes developed a big fat tumour the size of a melon, mum. Yeah. That's, that's, that's all right. Um, now, when, when but that, that, sorry, that must be a, you know, that must be a fascinating thing. I, I think there is a strong connection between, between p- people with disabilities and their mums. And I think, you know, for a lot of reasons, I think, you know, for me, my, my, my mum was the one that took me to the clinics. You know, your, your mum does all the kind of medical stuff often. Um, but also, you know, I don't know how to explain. I, I'm, there must be a pit of my mum's brain right at the back just thinking, what did I do? What did I do wrong? And, you know, the chances are she didn't do anything wrong. It's just a thing that happened. Yeah. And we've found, we've talked to people that have had horrific car accidents where their parents have been at fault on this podcast. Yeah. And, you know, the people with a disability don't even blame their parents for that. You know what I mean? Because, and like, I don't. Like, I, I would agree with you. I reckon my mum would have a percentage in her brain. Like, what have I done to do that to Dylan? I, I couldn't give a shit. Like, my life's <laughs> yeah. times better than it would have been. But on the outside, people would feel sorry for my mum for producing a child with a disability. Well, funny you say, so in 20, 2008, which was when I first met you, Dylan, at the um, Beijing Paralympics, mm-hmm. I remember being at the closing ceremony and on the way in, everyone was given, lit- was given postcards. And the idea was you would write a postcard and address it. And on the way out of the stadium, it was already stamped, on the way out of the stadium, you would put it in a letterbox. And that way, everyone that was at the closing ceremony at Beijing sent a postcard around the world that was like this outpouring of love and i remember sitting there covering it for the abc having had that was the first time i'd been to the paralympics having had this incredible experience not just at the paralympics but in beijing generally and i I sent a card to my mum saying thank you for whatever it was you did that got me here and i kind of meant it in that way of look even if you did do something that led to me having a foot it's given me this amazing life and yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I never followed it up with her. I just sent it and I thought it was pretty obvious what I meant. And years later I was kind of talking to her and she went, Oh, I thought you just meant like the conception. <laughs> <laughs> Straight over the head. 10 years later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For the Valentine's Day night. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, um, good. Were you always funny, Adam, growing up or did you use humor to deflect um, maybe some comments around your foot? I don't know. I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, look, I always wanted to be funny growing up. There's definitely that. Whether or not I was is a different question, but I always loved comedy and, and, and wanted to be funny. Was it because of my foot, though? I don't really know. Because when I think back, it's a, bit, it's a weird one. It's a bit like, you know, I grew up in the, in the Sutherland Shire, a place called Loftus in Sydney, which is, which is quite... We, I, I was the only kid at school with what would be termed a disability. And so therefore it wasn't, it's like there wasn't a category for me. So it wasn't a disability. I didn't think it was a disability. I'd never really, I don't really remember having, being teased because of my foot. I mean, I was teased for a whole bunch of other reasons, being the nerdy <laughs> kid, whatever, yeah. but not because of the foot. So I didn't feel like I ever had to, and the, I mean, I guess the other thing for me is I could hide it. I could go to school and wear a pair of long trousers and no one knew. And I still played rugby league and I still played tennis and I still played cricket and it didn't really kind of stand out or stop me from doing anything. So I, n- I don't really remember being teased. I mean, I was definitely bullied at school by various people, but again, not because of the foot. Yeah. Um, and, and I say that because, you know, bullies are pretty cruel and if they want to go to your weakest spot, they will. And I was called a lot of things at school, but never, you know, never anything derogatory about the foot. So, and I think that's because I was just lucky enough that it didn't stop me doing anything and I didn't look different. Because let's be honest, that's what the kids want to pick on when they're at school, Mm -hmm. someone who looks different. So, and funnily enough, I used to talk about this um, as part of my stand-up show, but the one thing I did when I wore shorts to school was I pulled my socks up to my knees because that would then cover the foot because I didn't want the foot to stand out. And uh, I realised, you know, I was the only, every, every other kid at school would just let their socks roll down to their ankles and I'd have my socks pulled up. 
And then I was getting teased for being the idiot with his socks up. For being a nerd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Christy boy with his perfect school uniform. Yeah, yeah. So eventually this one day I went, you know what? This is ridiculous. I'm going to, right, I'm going to own this. I'm going to roll my socks down. I don't care if anyone thinks my foot looks stupid. I'd rather look stupid because of something I can't control than something that I can. Rolled my socks down. No one said a word about my foot and no one teased me about my socks. And it was suddenly, it was a real ownership thing of going, oh yeah, right. Being a nerd is way worse than being disabled. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> I found the same thing. As soon as I owned my disability, people's perceptions began to change, but also my own perception of myself changed straight away. Mm. And then your confidence level, I guess, increased. And it's an interesting question because I know you even said it then, like you never really saw yourself as having a disability. As mm. you've got older, have you kind of owned that? A bit more or do you still not really classify yourself as disabled it's been a really long slow process for me i think in that i, I don't know i'm like i remember being about maybe 12 or 13 and mum saying to me hey you know the doctors want to know if you'd like to try out for the disabled games was the mm. way she put it Sounds and great. at that point yeah i was playing a lot of tennis um and able-bodied to you know competitive tennis against able-bodied players and i kind of went no if i'm going to win wimbledon i'm going to win it I'm going to win Wimbledon. I'm not going to win the disabled Wimbledon because there was, I mean, there wasn't even a disabled Wimbledon. No, it didn't uh, even come until 2014 or whatever. So. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but also my naivety, I had no idea what the Paralympics were. I thought, and it's not even fair if I run against someone in the 100 metres because I'm only missing my ankle. What if I'm up against someone who's missing both legs above the knee? That's not fair. Like, I didn't even know there were categories or anything like that. So, I guess... I just wanted to do, I didn't see myself as being disabled. And the real eye opener for me was Beijing in 2008, watching the Paralympics and watching Paralympians go by and kind of having the realization that, oh no, hang on, they don't think they're disabled either. Do you know what I mean? Like none, none of the people, or the majority of the people that I saw, they were just doing their thing, whatever their thing was. It wasn't like I'm doing a disability thing. It's I'm doing my sport to the absolute utmost. And I kind of, I then started kicking myself going, man, I missed out on this whole thing that I could have been a part of that I, had, I knew nothing about. But then also along the same lines as that. So on that, when it, when it came to stand-up comedy, I wanted to prove myself as a stand-up comic without the disability. I wanted to do what able-bodied comedians do, which is just be funny without relying on your disability. Um, and it was only a whole bunch of things happened to in the year 2001, I was nominated for the Perrier award at the Edinburgh fringe festival, which is pretty much like one of the highest awards you can be nominated for in comedy. And just being nominated made me go, right. I think I've proved myself. I, I know now I can do this and no one's giving me an award out of sympathy was the, was the honest truth. And then a few months after that, September 11 happened. And security guards were getting freaked out by my prosthetic when I would go through metal detectors. Mm -hmm. All right. and, and I ended up writing a routine about it, but it's based on truth is that I, you know, three days after September 11, I went through Heathrow airport and the security guard, my foot set it off, came over and was like, right, what's going on? I said, oh, it's a prosthetic. And he went, Oh gee, sorry, mate, go, just go, just go. And I was so didn't even check that there wasn't a knife <laughs> in your prosthetic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it kind of harked back to something that, I learned in the very, very early days of comedy. So probably I'd been doing comedy for maybe a year and a half. And I was emceeing a show at the Sydney Comedy Store, early and late show. And half the audience from the early show stayed over for the late show. And I only had one act. So I was like, do I do the same jokes for them or do I try something different? And I did a joke about my foot, which was based in truth. I was at a party. I told people I had a prosthetic foot and someone said, a woman said, can you still have sex? <laughs> yeah, right. There was no punchline to it. I just told it. It got a bit of a laugh. We moved on. And this comedian afterwards came up to me, an older comic. who was a bit full of himself, but it was good advice. He said, look, he said, you're not good enough to talk about your foot yet. And I said, what do you mean? He went, you're still learning out how to be, you're still learning how to be funny, how to win an audience over what it is you're trying to say hone your craft first and then talk about your foot work out why you're talking about it and how to be really funny about it but don't talk about it now and so i didn't talk about it for like 13 years ah that's interesting though because a lot of people um say that using the f word can be an easy way in comedy to 
get a laugh out of somebody. So you yeah. having that as a visual piece to play with, I guess he probably saw as like an easy way to get a laugh when really you need to get the most difficult laughs in that learning. Absolutely. And it went back to that thing of, I want to do what, what the able-bodied kids do. I want, yeah. I want to do whatever they do. So after then, you know, I'd been nominated for the Perrier Award, which meant, okay, tick, I have honed my craft. I've worked out how to do this to a degree. And then after September 11, and that, that whole thing in the security, I just thought, I need people to know it's okay. Like, don't be so scared of offending someone with a disability that you don't check whether or not they're carrying a knife in their leg. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so all of that came together, I think, for me, that, that combination of working out my craft, finding a reason, and then I retold that story about the woman saying, can you still have sex at a party? And realised that my response should have, been, should have been, well, yeah, of course. What does your husband do? Does he have a run-up? <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly that's the difference yeah. in not knowing your craft and knowing your craft is taking something funny that someone said and then making it better. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was, you know, this, this and I only realised this when, so, so I wrote a book a couple of years ago. I was asked to write a book and I, I thought it would be great to just write a book about all my stories and stand up that led me to where I am. And the publisher said, we really think people want to read about your foot. That's kind of the in, that's kind of your thing. And I was like, oh man, I didn't want this to be that. Mm. And they said, is there a journey you've gone on? You know, the usual publisher stuff. Is there a journey you've gone on? I was like, I don't know. So I said, I called the book Best Foot Forward. Okay. And, but as I wrote it, I kind of realized I had to then ram in the theme of my foot into the book. But as I wrote it, I went, oh no, this has been, even my comedy career has been this long, slow process of, trying to do what the able-bodied kids do, proving myself, then realising I've got a point of difference, then finding a reason to talk about it, to let people know it's okay to have questions, to, to feel awkward and to not worry about embarrassing people. And then gradually getting to the point of going, actually, this is my best foot because it's the one that's taken me more places than the other one. Well said. Love it. Um, do you feel, Adam, that you're comfortable saying that you have a disability seeing as you've lived your life mostly able-bodied because i i wonder <laughs> somebody that's completely able-bodied do you see somebody in a wheelchair who as you say is much more disabled than i am and then because you're under classified under the same umbrella does that at times make you feel uncomfortable having that label oh absolutely absolutely for me i mean even 20 2008 was amazing like i said an eye-opener 2012 watching the Paralympics GB team come into the uh, Olympic stadium in London as fireworks went off around them, as David Bowie's we can be heroes blasted out over the stadium. Hang on, dressed like, like MTV spacemen. You know, they had like these weird space suits on. Yes. Or yeah. Yeah. Silver oh. space suits. They, they looked pretty yeah. I was impressed. With Stella McCartney designs, yeah. oh. I reckon something in the back of my head went, do you know what? I've identified as able-bodied all my life, but I want a part of this. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> because you don't have a foot, um, something we yeah. explored with a girl called Cherie, who was amputated at the age of three because of cancer in her hip. She lost her leg. Um, she has phantom pain. So she had to reschedule one of our interviews because she was having really bad phantom right. pain for a leg that doesn't exist, but her brain is telling her pain is there. Do you ever have feeling for the foot that never existed? No. So the only, because the only thing that was amputated were those toes. Like, a, so those, those toes that I were, was born with, they used to stick out the front of the prosthetic. There used to be a hole and they stuck out the front. Sounds when I was about 14, I was playing soccer and one of the kids kicked, went in for a tackle, missed the ball and hit the toes. Ooh. Ouch. And they were stitched. I had to have two stitches in them. But gradually, as I got older, I couldn't move those toes. They didn't serve any purpose. And as I got older, the bulge became more apparent. It was harder to make a prosthetic that kind of looked good. And so I had them, I had them amputated. Um, and even then, you know, this, so there was always a part of me thinking, should I have done that? Was that vanity? Because it was really only for the look of the, yep. the leg going down. Um, so that's the only thing that I've lost. And although they would have cut through nerves and the toes did have feeling, I, I never had the phantom pains. So no, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. When we, when we did our disability rugby tour of Australia, um, I shared with a guy who was an above knee amputee and he'd, he had played so hard in our first game, they had to re-amputate his stump, another 10 centimetres up, the femur. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that when we got to it. Even when you run, with your yeah. foot, is your, is your stumped 
absolutely blistered and gross? No, because I've got, again, because I've got, my, mine and wasn't an amputation. I've got the ankle. I've got a heel. I've got, I can actually, I can weight bear on it. So guy, his stump would be, just get chopped up. Oh, man. And he was talking, when he came back, when he came back from that operation, he was explaining how it was basically every time he ran, the stump would just lift out of the socket a little bit. And then when he put it back down, it was basically bone on carbon fiber, which I'm lucky I don't get. But I do get, I get um, like infected hair follicles. Oh, right. Nice. The sweat anyone, of it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Anyone with a prosthetic, especially a prosthetic leg, knows the horror of the infected hair follicle. Because have, you ever, it, have you ever done the goose step and your foot fallen off? <laughs> <laughs> it's the way it's can again, because of the way my ankle, it doesn't just slot down. It kind of goes down and then hooks in, in. Right. hooks in. So I, but because of that, I have a door on the back of my prosthetic. So I have to put my foot in and then put the door on and then strap it up with Velcro. Mm. But on the blade that I use for rugby, um, the doors at the front rather than the back because the blades at the back. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is when I run all of my weight goes on that front door. So that's 82 something kilograms going down on that. And eventually over time, either something will break or the Velcro will just open up or so I was a couple of years ago, I was on the beach with my girls and with my daughters and I went, come on, let's have a race. And after four steps, the door <laughs> opened and I just fell flat on my face and my foot fell off on the beach. <laughs> we win. We win. <laughs> Hey, you've got 495 days now to the Paralympic Games. Yep. Did you ever run? You quick enough? Can you, how good are you at running? What would have been your sport? I, I mean, that was a, so after Beijing in 2008, interestingly enough, um, the coach of the wheelchair tennis team came up to me and said, look, I hear that you used to be a tennis coach and played competitively. And I said, yeah. And he said, would you be interested in wheelchair tennis? And I went, well, yeah, except that I don't use a wheelchair. And he went, yeah, but your disability might actually qualify. Wait, are you trying to say you and I could have been doubles partners? <laughs> Turns out. You bastard. Why did you call me? <laughs> well, so what happened was, so, I mean, you know, it was the end of the, it was the, it was the last night. It was the final night of the Paris. And um, this guy, and I said, I mean, this could be a thing. Let's think about it. And he saw some look in my eye and he went, hang on everyone gets like this on the last night of the Paris. Yeah, right. <laughs> and Very let's much, let's yeah. catch up a couple of months down the track in Melbourne and see how you're going. And so I met up with him. Um, Jason Helwig was his name. Yeah. He was the chef de mission. In yeah, yeah, yeah. 2008, yeah. I met up with him in Melbourne a few months later and he sat down and said, look, okay, if you really want to do this, if you want to play wheelchair tennis, he said, and the good thing about you is he said, most, a lot of people in wheelchairs have never played tennis. He said, you've played tennis. You've just never been in a wheelchair. So he said, that's what we need to teach you. But he said, you know, need to start living your life in a wheelchair. You need to do 30 hours a week. You need to oh, right. around the house at work. It needs to become second nature. Exactly. The best advice for that is if someone has an accident and they need to get good in a wheelchair, go to the supermarket because you're constantly stopping, starting, doing little corners. So right. it's like, you know, you know, or, like, or like a big, like a Chadston or a Miranda Fair or whatever. Like yeah. you're, you're constantly weaving out of people. So you get really good at being in your chair. There you go. Little life hack for you. There you go. Fascinating. So I, and I had said to him at that point, we were like three, four years into Spicks and Specs. And I said, look, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm hosting a TV show that we're, we're writing and filming every week. I said, I, I genuinely don't think it's, I can spend that much time in a wheelchair. And he looked at me and he then went, tell you what, he said, in all honesty, the best thing you can do for the Paralympics right now is to tell people about it. Tell as many people as possible. And then I saw him in 2012 in London. We had a walk around the park together and he went, and now you're doing it. You're telling people about the Paralympics. Amazing. But so if there was a sport, funnily enough, it's really interesting that wheelchair tennis didn't feel right for me because I've not grown up playing it. That's not the sport that I play. And so I've, you know, as we've talked about, I've been recently been playing disability rugby league, but I'm mates with John Fitzgerald, the um, Australian tennis player, former Australian tennis player. And, a couple of years ago, I was at his place and I was on crutches because I'd fractured my ankle playing league. And he went, mate, why don't you play disability tennis? And I said, well, because it doesn't exist. And he went, well, yeah, there's wheelchair tennis. And I said, yeah, but that's, that's a different game than what I grew up playing. That's, yeah. And you know yourself, Dylan, there's, you move differently for a start, but you hold the racket differently. You've got to hit, you've got a completely different, I've watched the way you play. 
whether it's serving, but in particular forehands and backhands, you've got a really extreme grip. The ball's most likely above your head. That's a, that's a completely different skill set to the skill set I've got. And Fitzy said, well, maybe you should invent disability tennis, like, you know, non-wheelchair physical mm. disability tennis. Yeah, standing up. Yeah. So if there, if there was a sport that was, you know, that I could play with my disability tennis-wise, that would absolutely be where I'd end up. In but, today, okay. Well, here's a question for you, Dylan, because I don't know the answer to this. Because then, well, Fitzy was going, well, is there, you know, can you do this? Can you invent this sport? And I was like, I don't know how you make it fair because do you have a class for people with one leg, an above knee amputee, a double above knee amputee, a double below knee amputee, one, one arm, arm, two arms, yeah. cerebral palsy? It would be, it would be above knee versus below knee. So, sorry, above knees play above knees and below knees play below knees, depending if you yeah. have one or two legs, similar athletics. Yeah. So the people that play, um, there's actually a guy who plays on the ATP tour, like against the Roger Federer's, who's fully deaf. Oh, yeah. wow. And he's from Taiwan, I think. Um, there's also a guy from South Africa who's got one arm and he throws the ball up in his... So if you, if you right now make an L with your arm, he's got just a little bit below the elbow. He throws the ball up with his elbow. Right. Oh, he, yeah, and he plays on the, on the everybody circuit too. So they're the only two I can think of. But obviously, once you lose, lost a foot or a leg... You wouldn't be able to play Roger Federer. You could play him, but he'd kick your ass. So. <laughs> yeah. um, in 2012, Adam, you said that uh, the problem with the word disabled is there's so many negative connotations. Uh, fast forward eight years. Do you think the world's getting better? Um, yes, yes, yes. I think, I think that's what I love about the Paralympics is that the Paralympics does that every four years. It, it makes the world slightly more aware or accepting or understanding or, or celebratory of disability. And it does it in this like little explosion that goes out from Beijing and then another one that goes out from London and another one that goes out from Rio. So I think, you know, every time people see, <coughs> and also then the TV coverage gets better and the viewership gets better and it looks cooler. And so I think more and more kids in particular become aware of disability and see people like, you know, I'm going back to 2012 in London, but um, uh, David Weir, for instance, uh, or Johnny Peacock, they see them as heroes and they want to be like them and they look up to them, or Ellie Simmons. Um, that I, I just I choose them because it happened particularly in London in 2012. Um, and then you see them, you know, on Dancing with the Stars or something like that and go, great, okay, that's, that's helping, that's making the step. But then unfortunately... There's a weird little backlash, I think, that happens from that, is that then people start to think, well, all disabled people can do anything. Yeah, and I face that myself. Really? Yeah. Well, the able-bodied, the disabled world resents you because you're the Paralympic guy. And unless you're a Paralympian or you're talking about why you're disabled, that's the only way you could get back on, get on TV. Right. And there is a, so even because I, the example that I use, Adam, is um, yes, I am 100% the lucky one and and I'm the one who's broadcasting and, and I'm so appreciative of the opportunities that I've had. Yeah. If you take away the fact that I've won gold medals and, you know, work on radio and that, I'm still the same guy who gets discriminated against trying to get into a restaurant. Yeah. I'm the same guy who is standing to get on a plane and they ask the person next to me, is he going to be okay, assuming they're my carer? So right. you know, I'm a disabled person, you know what I mean? But yeah, I, I do feel sorry for the disabled community who aren't Paralympians because there is this assumption that you're all just, why don't you just go to the Paralympics? Why aren't you a Paralympian? Yeah, why, yeah, can't, yeah. why can't you do that? So it does, it does have it a bit for sure. And then I think what the flow on effect from that, and especially in the UK where you've got, you know, a government that is cutting back on disability benefits, then disability and benefit, the word disability benefits becomes associated with the words benefits fraud. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and part of that is because people are going, but, but why aren't you like Johnny Peacock? Why aren't you at the Paralympics? Disabled people can do anything, right? We, we've learned this from the Paralympics. Disabled people don't need anything to hold them back. So why do you need benefits now? Are you a benefits fraudster? And then it's that. So it actually, in a weird way, it makes it people more aware of what disability is, but it makes them, makes them more aware of a certain part of disability and it'd be like saying to an able-bodied person well why do you need benefits because able-bodied people compete at the olympics yeah right now you touched on the importance of the paralympics being broadcasted and i think being broadcast in a in a different way um it mm. used to be very kumbaya let's yeah. all hold hands the, the paralympians are here 
when it's an elite sporting um, event where we train our lives to, you know, put on a show. Yep. You have to say, you know, I haven't, I've said this to you before, but not in a public forum. You, you really meant a lot to me, especially what you did in 2012 with the last leg, which started as a highlight show of the Paralympic games. And I think one of the things that white meant so much to me is um, I'm lucky, not to the extent that you are much funnier than I am, that I had a bit of wit and the ability to make humor to break down barriers and change stigmas about my disability. It was the biggest tool I had. And yeah. if you aren't a confident young person with a disability, especially at school, especially in a, a high level disability that you can see, it's so hard because that social aspect of having a disability, especially for young kids, they might never get out of that. And I think why the last leg and what you do is so refreshing is we are normal people first and foremost, who are elite athletes who you celebrated on the show, but you also took the piss out of on the show. And that normalized after us as people because it made us look like normal people. Well, Australian humor is very self-deprecating and a lot of people would be scared to make a joke about somebody who's got a disability for the fear of being yeah. backlash or people going, oh my God, he's picking on a disabled person. Yeah. Whereas and the, that's the humor that everyone in Australia kind of comes to. The best thing for. is whenever it was disability, it was always inspirational, but you know what you did? You made it entertaining. <laughs> it was entertaining and that changed the landscape and i think it's had that flow on effect because obviously the last leg is now what it is been going for eight plus years and is one of the biggest shows in the uk and here in australia all around the world did you do that on purpose going in did, was that a risk that you took or were you just did you decide that you were going to back yourself and make a show like that and just hoped everyone got on board uh both. I mean, yes, yes, we did decide we were going to make a show like that and take a risk and hope everyone got on board. And uh, when the when the promos first went to air for the last leg, Channel Four got so many complaints on Twitter from people going, "I can't believe you're doing a Paralympic show called the Last Leg. What is wrong with you, Channel Four? Yada yada yada." But when you look at how the Last Leg came about, there are so many, I mean, so many um, influences, and a lot of them Australian. You can trace it back for me to 2008 at the Beijing Paralympics, the first session we were given was by Jason Helwig, who was the, the chef de mission of the Australian team. And he gave a session to all of the ABC um, journalists, reporters, etc. And he said, I'm just going to say this up front. These are elite athletes. If you treat them as elite athletes, then they will respect you and they'll give you everything you want. And that's all we ask is that don't treat them as quote inspirational or having a go or even just people with disabilities. They are, these are people who have busted their asses for the last four years, some for their entire lives to be here, to be at the top of their sport. And that's how we would like you to refer to them. So that was always in the back of my head. And that's what I learned in Beijing. Then when channel, so when channel four asked me to make the last leg, that was the first thing I said was this can't just be a piss take. It's not, it's not an, an hour or a half hour of, hey, how funny are disabled people? Mm -hmm. We've got to respect the sport. The sport has to come first. And we've got to celebrate the gold medal achievements. And we've got to talk about the great things that are going on sporting-wise. This, this is a sporting event. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the kind of rebellious and revolutionary way of, of an unusual way of talking about it is to treat it like a sporting event. Because that's what people don't expect. They expect it to be, hey, everyone's having a go. Isn't this awesome? No, it's a, it's a sporting event. And if you do that, then that's the best way in. Now, add to that, the head of Channel 4 at that point, Jay Hunt, was an Australian, born and raised in Australia. So she had fond memories of Roy and HG in 2000. Yeah, dream. And the dream. Dream. Before. Yeah. It was just perfect. That's so the wombat. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So what she wanted was the dream but for the paralympics and she could say that to me because i was australian and she didn't have to explain anymore i knew exactly what she meant and my response was great let's combine everything that was great about roy and hg and everything that i learned in beijing which is respect the sport respect the sport talk about the sport the sport's the main thing and then we had an amazing producer called pete thomas who i sat down with who <laughs> for another australian reference kind of went he also said, look, we've got to explain disability to people because they will have questions. That's not why we're there, but, you know, he was a sports producer. And if we're going to make people appreciate the sport, 
then you've got to answer a few questions along the way about disability. But the sport was really what came first. And the, the other Australian reference I was going to mention was he was saying, we need to find a way at the beginning of the show to set up what the show is going to be. And I went, oh, great. We'll do like a, a teaser with a kind of a tonight on the show. We're going to cover this and we're going to cover this and we're going to look at this and this gold medal and that gold medal. And as I was saying it, I realized I was sounding like Billy Birmingham's wide world of sports. All yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And one of our writers, Adam Vincent is a South Aussie guy. And as I was saying it, I went, uh, and he looked at me and he went, bye, geez, bye, jingos, bye, crikeys. <laughs> yeah. And then Pete, the producer went, I said wide world of sports. And he went, I don't know what that is. And he went, but I've heard the parody of that. And I went, yes, that's exactly what it is. So even when you watch the last leg now, the beginning of every show, when I say tonight on the show, we're going to cover Boris Johnson's big news. We're going to do this. At the back of my head, I'm going, and that for croquet fans, once again, there's yeah. stuff all for you on the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Adam, we've got a, a, we put up on our socials that we were going to be chatting to you and a lot oh, yeah. of people had questions for you. And I've written some of these down and going to give them the credit they deserve um, yep. on Instagram, uh, which is at listenable underscore pod, podcast uh, for people who want to hear it and see it. Uh, Dan Frost said, did you Adam find it challenging not being able to participate in mainstream sports growing up? And if so, any advice for teens in similar situations? Oh, well, no, I, again, lucky is a word that I use a lot, but yeah, I, I, I started playing tennis. I guess I had tennis coaching lessons when I was about five. Um, I probably started playing competitive tennis when I was maybe 12. Um, I think by the end of, by the time I was about 16 or 17 and I was finished playing juniors, I was playing maybe B grade, low A grades. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I played it in the men's comp. I was playing A grade again. So no, I was, I was lucky. What I found frustrating, interestingly enough, um, was when it came to rugby league because it got to a point where playing rugby league for the school. I just couldn't keep up mm. and it's, you know, you get to 12, 13, 14. And I didn't, I thought that was just me, but since helping out and playing rugby league in, in the UK with the Warrington Wolves disability team, I've realized that there is a subsection of people with disabilities like mine that, that came from birth, whereby you could, you could compete with the able-bodied kids up until a point. And then it gets to, and it seems to be about 13 or 14 where the able-bodied kids just get stronger and stronger and you go, oh, okay, this is going to hold me back a little bit now. I didn't think I was frustrated until I found Disability Rugby League in the UK. And until I realised how desperately I wanted to play rugby league again. And to the point where anyone who knows me knows that I travel, so I live in London. I go to Warrington every Tuesday, which is a two hour train ride. It's about, I think it's a 600 kilometer round journey. Shit. Might even be longer. So that I can train for an hour and a half and play rugby league with these guys or with disabilities. So my advice would be if you're frustrated by the lack of um, opportunities for, for your disability in your chosen sport, then see what you can do about going out and making some. Yeah, well said. Yeah invent a, invent whatever the sport is invent a disability version of it because again what's been fascinating for me is finding out there's a lot of other people like me who what, either did play rugby league and had an accident and couldn't anymore or always wanted to but were seen as the disabled guy who couldn't join in i think also with added the resources now online it's a lot easier to connect with people with a disability you just got to search you got to look around and ask people yeah, yeah. and well, sometimes you got to start that you got to start it yourself well, you know? exactly right um, yeah, man, just Google the terms disability croquet. I'm sure <laughs> something will come up. <laughs> and the, the work that you're doing with the, the doco around the rugby league and obviously um, the stuff with the last leg, um, the, the reason I wanted to get in the media is, you know, I like to think I like sharing people's stories and sharing my own, but the real reason was I never saw anybody like me on TV and mm. radio. And it was, it was my biggest driver. And I've gone on the record at saying that. And um, I think... I guess what I'm getting at is, are you proud of, I guess, what your body of work represents? Because the stuff you do on the last leg in particular, you know, with Alex and yourself and that, it's really revolutionized the media landscape because, you know, growing up for you, there would have been nobody with a disability mm -hmm. really representing in the media. What does that mean to you, I guess, to be one of the beacons for that? It's kind of bizarre because, like I said, I, I never saw myself as being disabled. I never saw myself as being a voice of people with disabilities. And even when we did the the last leg in London in 2012, I didn't, as far as I was concerned, I was showing off the Paralympics mm -hmm. and the Paralympics 
does great things for disability. But, you know, for me, it was just, this is, this is an amazing event and I want everybody to see it. And I just want to shout about it. So, but what's interesting is then, I guess even before that though, I would be doing stand up now that I think of it. I remember doing a gig at the London Comedy Store and this guy coming up to me afterwards saying that his daughter was born. And I, I've got a feeling he said his daughter was born without an ear, like just had one ear missing. And he said, I've never found it comfortable to talk about and I've never found anything vaguely amusing about it. And he said, watching you make jokes about your foot, it's made me look at my, think about my daughter in a different light. And so in a weird way, it was slightly accidental. Um, but little things like that. I remember being at the Adelaide, the Thebiton Theatre in Adelaide doing a stand-up comedy show. And often I'll have a sign interpreter on stage with me. And again, this woman came up afterwards with her daughter and said, my daughter's deaf. She's 18. I was actually a bit older. She was like 20, in her 20s. This is the first event I've ever been able to share with her. Mm-hmm. And certainly the first comedy night I've ever been able to share with my daughter. And that's not... I mean, all of those things are like little side effects. They're kind of like, you know, I, I wanted to have a sign interpreter so that the show would be accessible to everyone. But it's those little personal details. When that happens, those are the things that stick with me. And, and yeah, it kind of makes me, makes me happy that, and, and maybe a little bit proud that I was able to facilitate that. And you don't, I know from my experience, Adam, you don't do it on purpose, do we? Like, I don't do things in my life on purpose to get messages like that. But when you do get them, it's, it's pretty crazy, isn't it? Because like, you're just going about your life. So am I. So is Angus with his podcast, whatever it is. But, and, um, you know, the reason I say that is I was that kid watching your Melbourne International Comedy Gala Festival thinking that. You know what I mean? Right. I was that kid seeing you talk about being disabled. And I was like, shit, yeah, who's this guy? Because I <laughs> want to be that. I wanted, but I never knew that I could. And even though they're obviously very different disabilities, it's still the same umbrella where it gave me hope that you can you know, one day do something like that. Well, and, and for all you do for disability awareness and understanding and promoting, you know, awareness and, 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 and the podcast and all that kind of stuff, you know, I'd put it to you that seeing you crowd surf at whatever music festival that was, we, it, it probably has inspired way more kids than you can yeah. imagine. That's you know, a photo online easily. So. Sorry? That's my most popular photo. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can kind of sit there and go, do you know what? You could, you could have hosted a 10 part documentary series about the effects of, yeah. you know, that's disability right. on social life. And yet you just letting loose at a festival has possibly inspired more people than anything. So yeah. you, you don't, you're exactly right. You know, I, I thought, I used to think at some points on the last leg, we were selling out if we did a show where we didn't discuss disability because that's our thing. Why don't we? And then I would get people, disabled people saying, no, that's what we love about it. It's because you're a person with a disability just, and you don't have to refer to it. So right. I think you're exactly right. And when it comes to the Paralympics as well, you know, Paralympians, you know, you, you don't go out there necessarily, or maybe you do, but when you're playing tennis, you're not thinking with every shot, oh, I need to inspire someone. I need to change people's perceptions. <laughs> you're just doing your thing. But often doing your thing is, is, is what fires people up more than anything else. I had a guy come to a music festival and he goes, are you Dylan Orcott from Triple J? And I go, I am. He goes, I thought you were a black guy with dreadlocks. <laughs> He's like, you're a white guy in a wheelchair and I'm off my head. And that's freaking me out. And I was like, thank you. And he goes, I had no idea you're in a wheelchair. I'm like, that's what I want, brother. I want you not to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Adam, before you go, we, uh, we have a bowl of uncomfortable. Uh, this podcast is about trying to make people comfortable with the topic of disability and asking people uh, questions about their disability to normalize it. Um, so we do have questions that come through. One of the questions that uh, we got through, I'm going to name her. Her name is Bronte Latham. She wrote this publicly on our Facebook post about having you on the podcast. She wants to know the same question, which we actually asked a previous guest, Curtis McGrath, which is, is the foot on or off during lovemaking? prosthetic that is okay so i uh i always used to make the joke on stage about it which is you know i do take it off but it's pretty hard to look sexy while you're removing a leg <laughs> <laughs> like me trying to get skinny leg me trying to get skinny leg jeans off in a week, brutal. <laughs> but i remember and funnily that is a great question because that um 
I found out in 2012 that David Cameron, who was then Prime Minister of Great Britain, was a fan of The Last Leg and that he and his wife would sit up and watch us, you know, after the Paralympics every night. And it was a Channel 4 reporter, I think it was Krishnan Guru Murthy, who told me. And I said, are you sure? Like, are you just making that up? And he said, no, because I asked him what his favourite bit was. And he said, the bit where you and Alex answer the question, do you, do you wear your legs to have sex? <laughs> <laughs> the Prime Minister. And oh Alex's God. answer was better than mine. Alex's was, well, it depends how long I think it's going to take. <laughs> <laughs> the process might be longer than the act. Yeah. <laughs> hey, very good. Before we let you go, I've got to give you a little shout out. Yeah. Um, I've always secretly wanted to lick your face. And now I can because you have your own stamp, big man. I mean, genuinely, when I was asked if I'd be on a comedy legend stamp, I said yes. But then when I saw that the other three legends were Nolene Brown, Gary McDonald and Magda Zhabansky, my I genuinely thought, Oh no, no, they're proper legends. Yeah. Like they're real. Are you sure? Maybe my name accidentally was on someone's desk. Did they ex- did they write leg end and got it mixed up? I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. But yeah, I'm on a stamp. That's hilarious. Hey, you're the there's only one person here without a stamp, Angus. That's me, mate. I know Dylan did have himself. Yeah, I, had a, stamp. I had a hundred thousand in circulation in twenty sixteen. It's very weird, feels when you get a letter and it's your own stamp. Oh Just, you wait. It's whack. Very cool. I had to my grandfather's really proud, but I had to explain to my daughters what a stamp was. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Of course, this day and age, you don't really send mail, do you? Hey, um, can we get quickly, where can people, uh, in Australia, but we do have listeners across the world, where can they watch the rugby special as well? Um, so in Australia, it's, it's streaming on 10 Play. Uh, okay. In the UK, it was on Channel 4, but I think it's uh, still available on all four. Uh, it's not yet available around the rest of the world, but I'm hoping it will be. We're going to put it up on iTunes later this year. Amazing. Cool. And last bit, if you, if there's someone else out there, like a young Adam Hills, somebody who's in a similar situation to you or has a difference, I guess they're not proud of and wants to work in the media. What's your advice to that person? Uh, do your own thing. Do your own thing. If you want to be in the media, like, like pretty kind of what I said about sport as well. If you don't feel that there's a sport that's accessible for you, make one up, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't feel, and I, I've said this in, in other forums, but if you don't feel that there's, if you're an actor and you don't feel that there's a part for a disabled person that, that you want to play, write one, write right. a play, write a TV show, write a short film, you know, the way the world is now, you know, if you want to be a journalist, make your own podcast, make your own online stuff, apply. And also, you know, really take advantage of people's sympathy. I've <laughs> <laughs> hey, been that for 29 years. <laughs> Adam Hills, thank you so much for coming on Listen Neighbor. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.